Yes. Uh, I would say uh, half of the job of a think tank is to stop stupid things from happening. And so I, um, I would say that's probably about 50% of our job description. So I'm, um, uh, I was very, I reached out to my colleague, Shannon Green, who's gonna be moderating the panel. I said, we really need to write a case study about what happened when the State Department merged USIA in the late 90s. What was that all about? And we talked to a number of very thoughtful people who were uh, Foreign Service officers, both at State and Aid at the time. Um, because I think the reason we're having this conversation is there's a legitimate conversation going on in Washington about how do we improve, how do we be more effective, and how do we be more efficient, uh, and are there some savings? And that's a legitimate conversation, and I think that's an important conversation. Um, but uh, we wanted to make sure that that it doesn't mean that that every answer is the, or the right answer. And so one of the things we wanted to do was to say, okay, well, let's just make sure we recall within living memory, this only happened 20 years ago, let's at least get on the table what, what were the expectations at the time of the merger of USIA into state? What were the hopes and were those hopes uh, realized? And I would argue that many of them were, were likely not realized. And so why is that important? Because I think in the context of a conversation about should we mer fully merge USAID into state, my view is the answer to that is no. Uh, and that I, wor I worry that we will break or cripple our development capacities in, in ways that perhaps it's possible that it's, it's arguable that we may have broken or crippled some of our public diplomacy capacities when we merged USIA into the State Department. That would be my it's, it's contestable, and I think we'll have a chance to discuss this as a group, but that is what I would put on the table, and that's what the, the piece that uh, Susan, sorry, sorry, excuse me, Shannon Green and I wrote um, a couple of weeks ago, and it's gotten a lot of attention. Um, so let me just add one other point, which is we're doing this in the context we've convened here at CSIS a bipartisan task force on development, effectiveness, and efficiency, given the the conversation we're having. Uh, Senator Young's agreed to be a co-chair and Senator Shaheen. We've convened uh, Obama administration appointees, Bush administration appointees, retired foreign service officers. Um, and to actually, let's, this is a great conversation. This is an important conversation. So let's put on the table uh, fixes and improvements to make sure that we're doing things that are keeping the United States safe and making sure that uh, the United States, that ultimately that this is done in our our self-interest as well in that you know we, we have wealthier partner countries so that they're buying more stuff from us and that means more American jobs. So we should be helping developing countries uh, prosper because it's in the American self-interest and so it's a legitimate conversation the Trump administration's put on the table but let's just make sure we don't do anything stupid in the process. So that's the context for this conversation is to help us all remember what happened and what lessons we can take from it. So without any further ado, I'm gonna turn the floor over to my friend and colleague, Shannon Green. Shannon. Thanks, Dan, and thanks to all of you for being here. Clearly, this topic has struck a chord because this is a pretty large crowd um, for such an event. We don't have a ton of time, so I'm gonna very quickly introduce the panelists. Suffice it to say that we have a very impressive <coughs> team of four people who have held numerous positions in and out of government, both in the public diplomacy realm as well as development. So to my right, we have Susan Stevenson. She is currently the Acting Assistant Secretary in the Bureau of Public Affairs at the State Department, a career foreign service officer. She previously served as the Chief of Staff to the Undersecretary for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs, Director of the Undersecretary's Office of Policy Planning and Resources, a Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Bureau for East Asian and Pacific Affairs, and Director of the Foreign Press Centers. To her right, we have Bambi Arilano, who currently serves on the Lutheran World Relief Board of Directors. During her 27-year career at USAID, she served as a counselor to the agency, which is really the top spot in terms of a foreign service position coordinator for development and economic affairs in Afghanistan, and mission director in Egypt, Iraq, 
Ecuador, Peru, and the regional center in Budapest. So many global positions of high importance. To my left, I have um, Kenton Keith, who is an ambassador. He joined Global Ties um, U.S. Advisory Council in 2009 and serves on the boards of AFS USA, the Council on International Educational Exchange, and Partners for Democratic Change. Ambassador Keith served as the Senior Vice President of Meridian International Center from 1997 until 2010 after a distinguished career with the United States Information Agency, which is the topic of today's conversation, where he retired with the rank of career minister. And last but not least, to his left, we have Ambassador Stuart Holliday, who is the president and CEO of Meridian International Center. He served as the US ambassador for special political affairs at the United Nations from 2003 to 2005. Prior to that, he was the coordinator, which is an assistant secretary level position of the Bureau of International Information Programs and principal deputy assistant secretary for public affairs at the State Department. So clearly we have a group of people that are well versed on the issues that we're gonna be discussing today. So Kenton, I wanted to start with you. Could you provide us the backstory on the USIA State Department merger? What was the reasoning behind it? And in your opinion, what were the immediate ramifications in terms of public diplomacy? Uh, yeah, thank you, Shannon. I, I, uh, <clears throat> uh, it would take a lot longer than we have for me to go into <laughs> all, all of that. But let me just say that um, back in the uh, Clinton administration when uh, Vice President Gore was reinventing government with these golden hammers, uh, Secretary of State Warren Christopher came up with the idea that USIA should be folded into the State Department. Uh, the Gore people looked at that and said, no, that wouldn't work because uh, the, the uh, function is too dissimilar and uh, there wouldn't be any cost savings anyway good decision. Nevertheless, uh, it wasn't a year uh, later that USIA, AID, and the uh, Agency for Arms Control and Disarmament uh, were being folded into the State Department, and it was a process in which we had representatives at uh, a couple of level, levels negotiating. Uh, that negotiating uh, process I was in, in the middle of, I was representing USIA, and I, I found that the, uh, it took a while, but pretty soon uh, the, all the negotiators were almost on the same page. Uh, we differed on whether it was a good idea to begin with, but if it was, was to happen, there were certain issues that needed to be, uh, to, to be dealt with and agreed to. As far as the USIA nego negotiation was concerned, the two main concerns we had were wrapped up in something called bracketed language. And, in a, and that means, of course, that uh, we didn't come to an agreement. The, uh, the blueprint that we were negotiating was to go to the president on a certain day in July and that decision, those decisions in bracketed language would be, uh, would be reached at that level. The two main things that we were worried about were protection of the function in a department that had not typically been friendly to pu public diplomacy over the years. And the level of USI, uh, the level of uh, public diplomacy uh, policy making authority in the department. We wanted to see de deputy assistant secretaries at least in the regional bureaus because other than those at that level, you don't have, uh, if you don't have uh, deputy assistant secretaries at that level, you don't have a, a seat at the policy table at all. 
And uh, that was disagreed with uh, by our State Department colleagues. That was bracketed language. And we stepped into a situation where no real decision was reached uh, and until uh, it was clear that we were floundering. Um, the other issue that we cared deeply about was the protection of our exchanges budget. Our State Department colleagues wanted to have the exchanges budget wrapped into the usual State Department budget in which it would compete f with new office furniture for the consular offices or uh, new computers and so on. And we believed that we would not fare well in that competition. The State Department actually decided against us and had actually written letters to people who were considered stakeholders explaining that decision. <coughs> when down from the hill came uh, a, a message that it shouldn't happen that way, and it was turned around. So thank God the budget line items for uh, the exchanges, the Fulbright program and uh, educational and cultural exchange was preserved. As far as what the immediate, uh, immediate effect of the change was concerned in the field, you had the public affairs officer who beforehand was a, an agency head with control of budget and such little things as con his own car or her own car and the ability to manage on a, uh, on a tactical level the daily business of being a public affairs section without having to go through State Department filters. That changed almost immediately. And then there was a, a sense of uh, a lack of direction in the field. The first public affairs meeting that was held in Washington for all public affairs uh, officers, the biggest complaint was, we don't know who's running the show. We don't know where decisions are coming from. And we don't know how to uh, plead our case. Well, things have gradually improved on that, uh, on that scale. But uh, it has never gotten to the point where solid Washington decision making has been able to uh, come through to public affairs officers on a consistent basis. What does come through is a variety of taskings which, which have uh, public affairs officers spending a good deal of time, much of their time, writing reports on what they're doing about international protection of the pecans, uh, instead of managing a public diplomacy, an integrated public diplomacy program for their post. So that was, those were the, uh, the immediate problems that developed after the, uh, after the merger. And uh, there are many other issues that we could discuss. Great. Well, hopefully we can get to some of the medium-term and long-term um, challenges and ramifications, which is a good point to segue to Susan Stevenson, who was with USIA at the time and has spent um, the last 15, 16 years since the merger as a Foreign Service Officer at the State Department. So, Susan, I was hoping you could share with us what changes you observed as the shift happened, and how have you seen it affect the public diplomacy function at state over time? 
I would say that the merger between state and USIA from a change management perspective was handled extremely well in that we were told that we would be able to keep our the USIA IT, which was more advanced than what the State Department was using, that we would have best practices, and that we in the field, because at that time I was a seven-year veteran field officer at USIA, our operations would continue. And in fact, we had even doubted that the merger would happen because of the importance of what is now the Broadcasting Board of Governors, the fact that that would have to be kept independent. We couldn't imagine that VOA would be subsumed by state. What we didn't anticipate is the cleverness of the negotiators, including Ambassador Keith, to spin off the Broadcasting Board of Governors so that the surrogates and VOA were separate from the State Department. Almost immediately, as Ambassador Keith said, we felt the ramifications. Suddenly, PD work, which mostly is after hours work, going out and, and seeing contacts and things, we were told we, there would be no motor pool car, something as silly as that, because they weren't used to people doing after hour activities. Um, but more uh, fundamentally, the focus went from Washington supporting the field. In USIA, all Washington jobs supported the main actors who were the PD practitioners in the field. Suddenly we went from having Washington support the field to, to us, as the ambassador said, writing reports uh, for context to support Washington. All these taskers, briefing papers, et cetera, which were very foreign to us because we never had to do it back for Washington. The other big change, and this has been very gradual, but incorporating policy into public diplomacy programs. We always wanted to be very neutral. We wanted to be seen as the fair arbiters. We wanted to promote mutual understanding, so we wanted to be unsullied from policy. But in fact, over the years, and specifically over the probably about the past eight years, we have been much more sharply integrated into policy priorities. And I think that really has helped public diplomacy in terms of being seen by outsiders as relevant. The huge challenge for public diplomacy is we don't have immediate results. With the exception of press work, you can't tell when you send someone on an international visitor leadership program or on a Fulbright program what the results are going to be for you know, up to a decade. And usually the metabolism in Washington and in Congress, they can't wait that long for results. And so that long-term investment, that goal is somewhat blunted by the fact that they need to see immediate return on investment. And so we have seen um, not only the, the policy being integrated to show that we're relevant to the policy priorities of the day, but also somewhat of a loss of our contact work. We used to develop groups over you know, generations so that we were known quantity, we knew very well the people that we were working with in the NGO community, the education community, et cetera. Now the overwhelming focus is the newest, the brightest, get out with youth groups, get out with whoever is the, the practitioner of the policy at the moment. And what we've lost about that is, although we're very good at getting those new contacts, we're not so good at the whole maintenance of these important relationships that we've had over time. And you could argue we're reaching a broader group right now. Uh, another one of our big challenges, and maybe we'll get into that, is how we look at the impact of our activities. And I, speaking as uh, the normally the principal deputy assistant secretary in the Bureau of Public Affairs, was surprised that we had no evaluation mechanism across the Bureau. There was no expectation that we had to look and see what was working. And this is as recently as 2016, we finally got an, a Bureau evaluation expert. So it is incumbent upon us to show that what we're doing is working, but it is very difficult to prove that. Um, I think that we have much more opportunities. Um, in his day, Ambassador Keith was that rare person that was a public diplomacy officer from USIA who got to be an ambassador. There was maybe three or four when I joined USIA that we all knew their names. In fact, I'm, I'm so honored to be on the panel with you. Um, and nowadays, we are getting more and more public diplomacy officers as deputy chiefs of mission, principal officers, and even ambassadors. And that is a change that I directly attribute to being part of the State Department. So there are good things as well as some downfalls to the merger. Overall, have we lost all our effectiveness? No. Um, but it is something to be aware of as we look at other models of what might happen going forward. Thank you, Susan. Bambi, you've spent your entire career and positions mostly in the field in some very difficult places. 
When you hear from your colleagues on the panel, do you see parallels between the merger of USIA and State Department and some of the proposals that are floating around in terms of some significant consolidation of state and USAID? And I want to ask you for your opinion, what would that mean for USAID if there were to be some loss of independence? What would the impact be not only on the agency but on U.S. interests more broadly? Yeah, thanks, Shannon. I'm excellent. It's uh, always more difficult to be at the end because it's already been said, but I'll try to not be repetitive here. I think one of the most important points that has been made is that whatever this way this were to go, um, there are very, very important there's very important homework that needs to be done on both the credibility and the perception of the entity being merged or not merged, um, impact on policy and programs, and also impact on people and staff. Um, having worked very, very closely during the years of the USIA merger um, with public diplomacy people at POST, I know the toll that took and the adjustment it required. Um, in terms of parallels, um, the fact that it had already been being debated. I, I mean, this is something that USIA had been going through for some years. AID has been going through this will they or won't they discussion now for decades. So there's a lot of um, backstory here as to where this all comes from. The fact that Ultimately, at the end of the day, because I know the, right, the downsizing of USIA staff started like with USAID in 1997, um, and much of the kind of camouflaging it as reorganization took place after that. So ultimately, it was a budget decision that drove a reorg. I do not think that is a good idea. Um, having been managing missions at the time of USIA, USIA, USAID's right-sizing, um, it was very, very painful and um, not rational. And ultimately, because 9-11 then came totally non-productive, um, because then we needed to staff up. Um, in terms of savings, ultimately, from a budget standpoint, and predictability of savings, I don't think in today's world you have any. Um, it is an incredibly complicated world out there, and um, things change on a dime, and ultimately you may have to reverse what you've just done, so you really need to think it through. In terms of the impact um, of loss of independence, I, I just want to put a plug in here because having um, seen how my career evolved, having wound up working in places I never thought I would work, and everywhere I worked, spending probably a good 60, 70 percent of my daytime um, hours in activities completely aligned with the State Department and the interagency. I think we have come a long way in terms of foreign policy alignment. So I would not want that to be the excuse for a merger, because frankly, I don't think it's valid anymore. And I think most of the ambassadors I worked with would not want to do the accounting for AID and have to stand up in front of auditors and defend programs in very tough places. Um, it just, um, I see some faces in the, the audience that may want to contradict me on that. But um, I think the primary cost, and this is at the top level, really is the loss of flexibility and bandwidth. If there's anything we need in today's world, um, it is the flexibility of response. And I think that one of the things from my experience with USI, uh, USIA that you did lose was that flexibility. You talked about it, Susan, your ability to go out and have those very rich contacts. I have actually seen ambassadors bring in additional advisors that 20, 30 years ago would have been their USIA people because they just did not have that contact with the field that had been so rich when USIA existed. I think AID is in a very similar situation. The information you bring in from the field, the, the knowledge you bring, et cetera. And bandwidth, you mentioned this. Um, basically, USIA became at most embassies, you spend the majority of your time on press, press-related issues, um, you know, damage control. When I'm 
specifically related to Egypt. I saw the very, very active. And there were people that could have done other things, brought other richness to the discussion, but they were just really um, absorbed with the, uh, with the press function. Um, in terms of something else that I think uh, the loss of, of that separateness, um, I think most ambassadors do want as many tools in their toolbox as they can have. Um, it, it's then the issue is how the agency can respond to those situations. And I think there is a, a richness. They, the ambassadors tend, from my standpoint, what I've been able to observe, they don't want one stream coming from one angle. They prefer to have a variety of different solutions they can use in the field. Um, and particularly in an environment where a high threat environment where the, the operating environment is in increasingly complex. You want agencies that can be out there remaining on the ground and doing work. Um, the issue of external perception, country level perception and credibility, to me really is at the core of much of this discussion. How do you, in a world that is increasingly complex and where there are so many forces in the information age, which I think is one of the reasons that people would love to have USAI, USIA still existing in some form today, particularly on the civilian side, um, is how you, in very where, where so many of the information forces are working against you, how do you sustain a positive perception and cre credibility about the US and its motives? in that country. And I think this is something that um, USAID would struggle with. Um, if you all come under the same tent, it's great to have that alignment, but ultimately you're losing that variety and that ability to really um, keep a country with you come, you know, come hell or high water. Um, finally, a firefighting. Um, foreign policy ultimately is the day-to-day um, the what, what happens now, what happens tomorrow. Um, if you, the, one of the major impacts for USAID would be its ability to look medium to longer term and hopefully be able to contribute to identifying those strategic threats and challenges that are coming, not just in the 10 countries that receive the vast majority of uh, foreign assistance, which are all high threat posts, but those other countries and regions where the threat may be less today, but you need that analysis of what may be coming at you tomorrow. Great. So Ambassador Holliday, a lot of the discussion is around how do you defend public diplomacy and an independent development agency on the basis of US interest? So I was hoping you could help us take a step back and kind of frame how we can think about these two functions as they serve US interests, and also how you think we should be organizing these pieces to maximize America's soft power influence. Sure. Um, Thank you. First of all, a pleasure to be here. Um, I think the taxpayers fund our uh, government to protect their interests, and the question is, how do you define that question? Um, Development and public diplomacy are two valuable tools that allow the U.S. to project values and invest in people in a way that builds relationships over a longer term. Our short-term foreign policy doesn't always have that as at, it, at its uh, you know primary core function. We have to deal with the day-to-day -day crises. Uh, we have to be transactional, and so by diluting our ability to reach those audiences either through the diplomacy of deeds, which is to help people. Um, ultimately, a leader, a global leader, is only a leader if people follow that leader. It's not about what they say, it's about what they do. And through effective diplomacy, public diplomacy and development, we have the opportunity to show people who we are as a people and to have them be drawn to us. Ultimately, that's going to be what creates the framework for our prosperity and security. And I think getting back to the point that's been mentioned here, by centralizing that function, you're just you know, limiting your toolkit and your flexibility in terms of what your outcome is. 
Uh, you, you know, in the corporate sector, you talk about third-party advocacy, you talk about building coalitions, you talk about strategic networks. That's the way the, world's go the way the world is going in terms of effective private sector engagement. And um, the question is, what's the most effective way for us to present ourselves? And I think the evidence is pretty clear that having that ability of a group of people, of American citizens, whether they're AID uh, workers, aid workers, whether they're USIA or public diplomacy officers, or private citizens volunteering or students traveling overseas to study. It gives us leverage, it gives us strength. And I think anything that erodes that is problematic. Now, from the, the cost saving standpoint, obviously consolidation or a merger is always, looks really good on paper. You think of AOL, Time Warner, you know, Compaq, Hewlett Packard, um, you know, Microsoft, Nokia, all of these things are designed in theory, we're going to be, you know, we're going to, we're going to bring in the best of what it means from that institution and it's going to somehow infuse the rest of the other institution. Well, it, we know that it just doesn't work that way and sometimes having lanes that are much more well coordinated, I, I do uh, strongly advocate for much more effective coordination. Um, when I got to the uh, White House, I, I actually started right after the merger, and my first job was to hire an aid director and a public diplomacy undersecretary. And they were, you know, these were totally discrete functions. They had completely discrete, you know, program management. The other one was a sort of a marketing function viewed that way. W what I think we 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 could do is without. Um, this wholesale consolidation is look for much more effective ways of, of having coordination, communication, and effective um, management of these programs. Because I do think that w we are living, first of all, in a world where our government, uh, different, different government entities aren't talking to each other as effectively as they could. We are, they do become like a school, you know, there's this class and that class and there becomes an institutional culture that develops. That can be very good for building up pride. But if you look at what the military has done with, you know, even with Delta Force, SEAL Team 6, all the various special units, uh, they have to begin to work in networks and work together more effectively. And I think that would be a better conversation for us to be having than a, than a merger, uh, for example. And um, I also wanted to say, as far as going forward, what Kenton said about the, 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 the exchange world and the long-term educational and professional and cultural exchange world, there's a reason why that uh, benefited, benefited from a degree of separation from uh, the day-to-day -day diplomatic activities of the embassy. And that's because there was never a quid pro quo. It was an investment in a human being. And I think our development programs um, while they do need to be aligned with our national security interests, who knows where the next conflict's going to be? Who knows where we're going to need basing rights? Who knows where we're going to need public support? And we know, we've learned the hard way over years and years of tough lessons, that if we're not investing in countries when they don't need us, uh, and we don't need them, excuse me, in the short term, we're just eroding our, our, our flexibility going forward. So short answer is I think that uh, Y the, the vestiges of USIA have done the best they can under difficult circumstances. There are many good stories, uh, I think. Uh, there's been some innovation uh, in the technology arena and my old bureau, IIP. And, uh, the, but the real question is, um, what's the most effective way of presenting ourselves to the world? And by collapsing our, in effect, our uh, you know, the, the legacy of George Marshall and all the goodwill that we, that we feel as a people to, to others that are going to lead them to see America as a, as, a, as a leader to follow. If we conflate that, diminish that in any way, I don't think that's helping us out. I also, just in closing, think that just the name AID is, is in this political environment is a tough name. Um, AID, if you're, you know, looking at the uh, polls in rural America and around the country and you think about what people think they need, they think they need AID. They think they need aid. And for them, uh, this is something which is a gift. It's a gift to somebody else, and they feel that they're not a part of it. So the real question is, looking at AID and public diplomacy, how can we build in more of the American people? How can we build in small businesses? How can we reach out and create sort of more of a bridge where we're more in the wholesale 
marriage of U.S. economic prosperity and international need than simply uh, a discrete function that is guarding itself uh, because it knows it's doing the right thing, but it's not that connected to what average Americans see as in their interest. Thank you. So I'm going to take the liberty of asking the first question, and then we'll open it up to the floor. So start thinking about what you might want to ask the panel. Um, so Ambassador Holiday alluded to this, which is about partnerships and innovation and really needing to think differently about the way that we do public diplomacy and development because the environment has changed, because official development assistance is down and assistance from the private sector is up, because public opinion in foreign countries is shaped as much by you know, cat videos and cultural and economic penetration in their society as it is by State Department talking points and press releases. So we're here talking about the structure, but the structure should follow the mission. So I'm just curious to get um, the panelists thought about, you know, how should we be thinking about the mission of public diplomacy and development and the current environment? And if there are then any things that follow from that in terms of the form that USAID takes. I think the, uh, <clears throat> the history of USIA was the history of helping uh, our publics engage with one another. Um, uh, at the risk of, of, of sounding too nostalgic, uh, in USIA, if I needed uh, someone who are an office that could help me generate cooperation between the faculty of political science in Istanbul and, and something like that, an equivalent in the United States, I had an office in USIA that would do that and do it on a very professional level. Or find me a, a printmaker to go to the uh, Istanbul uh, Fine Arts Academy that had the only thing that you could see was a Yankee go home on the front of the uh, on the front of the building. Uh, we lost with the merger, and and somewhat before the merger, we were beginning to lose a really amazing institution that was so good at engaging pu foreign publics with the United States in all kinds of ways. Uh, this is something that is. is uh, is, is not as emphasized, partly because the funding hasn't got, isn't there anymore. But uh, I, I agree that that has to be a, uh, uh, there has to be a refocus on that. I would just uh, say that because of their, because of the availability of so much information and where people are drawn, I have a 16 year old and a 13 year old and I have to hide their phones uh, before dinner. And they're watching everything, movies, short films, et cetera. And I'm sure that's the case where people have access to that around the world. So I think the idea of uh, investing, obviously development does this in human capital, in people. Some of our competitors in the world invest in infrastructure. That's fine. You need that. But we invest in people and we connect with people, education, economic development, entrepreneurship, women's programs, all those programs, critical exchanges. There's nothing, there's not a substitute for somebody's experience that they've had interacting and dealing with the American people. It could be more intentional in terms of looking for ways that that U.S. partner, mentor, peer continues to get and derive that connection, uh, benefit from that connection. I think that, that could be looked at. As far as the U.S. funded international television, media, radio, I just don't know. I'm, I'm reluctant to say. I. I I don't know that these are still the same days as during the Cold War when, when Voice of America was the only source of you know, credible information. Maybe we'll come back to that day where it's the only source of credible, <laughs> credible information uh, with all the talk about fake news and so forth. But I think it's what are people watching, where are they getting, in the, getting their information, and we need to be smart about that. But if they're doing it face-to-face, -face, we know it's happening. 
if I could follow on, we are in a major paradigm shift uh, because of social media, as Ambassador Holliday alluded to, that people are no longer looking at the elites, their government, the official media. They're looking much more towards their peers. And so for us, we've had to adapt. I mean, public diplomacy, that's been our sweet spot the whole time, is that we do connect with people. And what better than the alumni of our programs, rather than me, a US government official, talking about American democracy, have somebody that's been in, uh, on an international visitor leadership program, somebody who's lived here uh, six months as a UGrad exchange student, somebody who's been here as a Fulbright. Uh, they're the ones that can give firsthand testimonials, and they understand the cultural biases of their home country to be able to communicate even better. So I think one of the shifts, as Shannon alluded to, that we've seen is instead of us trying to speak officially as the US government is also reaching out to those partners and having them be the validators. So you can listen to me, but you will probably trust this person from your country even more because they have seen it with their own eyes. And of course, we've always done that to a certain extent, but in this age of networking and social media, it's more important than ever, and I think we are very well poised to take advantage of it. Yeah. Um I don't have much to add on the information uh, side because it is, as you all say, I mean, it really a new world. Um, on the development side, I think the major change in recent years, and this is something that, um, you know, it, you're really, you find yourself swimming upstream against, is the number of um, places where you now doing development work in the world that um, have major security issues. And um, so really getting out into the communities and being able to do that work is an increasing challenge. I mentioned I think um, countries are sort of divided into the ones that are high threat and where development must continue to occur because many of them are either so poor or so poor institutionally they want assistance. And then the massive number that really are um, among the poorest of the poor um, on the development side. Um, I think the challenge in terms of structure and organization is going to be how we and other agencies structure ourselves more effectively to work in that kind of bifurcated environment. Um, I think there's been a lot learned in recent years um, through massive country teams in places like Iraq and Afghanistan, but also what I know is very, very active country teams, be it in Asia and Africa, other places. So I think um, that whole how we structure interagency work and how USAID, from the standpoint of development, articulates better what this means, each of those country structures and regional structures, how they contribute to what will be um, a, a more secure world um, going forward. I, I think um, we've learned a tremendous amount, and um, there just is a lot to uh, put in writing and get everybody to buy into. Great, so now we're gonna take some questions from the audience. I ask that you raise your hand. We'll take three questions at a time. Please introduce yourself and your affiliation if you have one and keep your question to a question so that we can fit in as many as possible. So um, this gentleman up front was the first to raise his hand. Wait for the mic to come around. Uh, thank you so much. My name is uh, Khalil Stoltz. I'm from the Partnership for Public Service. And I would like to ask you, um, looking back on the USIA uh, State Department merger and looking towards the potential USAID merger, what do you think are the chief roadblocks towards a merger in general? Do you think there could be possibly a legislative roadblock where people in Congress or legislative branch speak out against it? Or do you think that it could be employees taking collective action? Thank you. orange dress or top. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Mindy Reiser. I worked for the Council for International Exchange of Scholars, which ran the Senior Fulbright Program for uh, a number of years. So my question has to do with education and the merger. On the one hand, of course, USAID has an education portfolio, and we have, of course, the work that's done with the exchange programs. On the one hand, there could be some good policy integration, but on the other, you may well lead, lose a diversity of voices and perspectives. 
And also, with new technology, there may well be less of a call for person-to-person -person exchanges and more use of media and Skype and those sorts of IT-mediated education opportunities. So I'd like to hear some thinking of where education, international exchange, and development can happily converge or maybe not so happily. Great. And one from this section? All the way to the back. Hi, my name is Mike Lally. I'm with the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. I uh, was wondering what your thoughts are on uh, Ambassador Mark Green and his recent appointment as U.S. AID uh, Administrator and how he will assist or um, work into these possible situations. Thank you. Great. So one on Chief Roblox to so the merger, where does education fit in, and then thoughts about Mark Green. Take any ones you want. I'll do all three real quick. Number one is Congress. Number two, <laughs> Mark, Mark Green is a very capable uh, leader, former ambassador to Tanzania. We couldn't have asked for a better choice, in my view. Uh, third, education, I'm gonna kick it over to Kenton. My experience of uh, the cooperation between USA, USAID and USIA in the field of education uh, cooperation in the field of education has been nothing but positive. Uh, I think back to our, my experience in Damascus when we went into Syria after seven years of diplomatic hiatus. And uh, I don't think we could have operated very effectively as USIS without AID, and I don't think they could have either. Uh, that, was, uh, that was a lesson that uh, everybody understood. Talk about alignment. Everybody understood that this was an area where we had to cooperate and could make uh, significant progress, and did. Uh, the question of whether uh, education as we know it in the traditional sense is uh, is going to be, uh, become less uh, important. I, I somehow don't see that. Uh, it will, uh, I, my, my belief is that anybody who can get out and go get a degree in the United States is going to get one, uh, or to not just the United States, but who is going to have an educational experience that will contribute to uh, uh, their, their future pro uh, progress is, is going to try to get it. Um, there will certainly be uh, an, an increase in the use of uh, technology, uh, information technology, because not everybody can uh, make this uh, uh, investment of, uh, of travel and study in another country. Although if I could supplement that, I think IT is definitely a complementary bonus to education, but can't replace the in-person experience. The example I'll give is these MOOCs, the massive on open online courses. We found that if we didn't, if we just left to their own devices, shared the resources of MOOCs, we didn't have a very high success rate of, of students actually taking courses and completing them. But in our embassy in Seoul, Korea, they found if they had a weekly kind of MOOC session that was administered by people within the Mission, they had a much higher completion rate. So it wasn't, you know, you did need to have the Americans there to kind of facilitate that you can't have it be all online because they just weren't that successful. Um, but it is something after you've been to the United States or have had that uh, touch of experience, it can enhance and, and complement, but it can't take the place of the in-person exchanges. Um, yes, I'll let um, uh, Stuart's uh, recommendation on both roadblocks and uh, Mark Green stand. Um, and the main thing for me on the education side, this is, this is where it gets a little complicated, and it has to do with earmarks. Um, USAID um, has a very, very heavy earmark for basic education. Um, in my experience, everything we do that is outside of basic education, which is not 
the so much the bailiwick of uh, public diplomacy or public affairs sections at, at embassies. Everything we do outside of that related to university or technical level education, we do it very closely coordinated um, with the embassy uh, and very often taking their lead in terms of what's actually needed. I think our involvement in higher education has been much more related to where there is a need for some kind of institution building or a technical gap in a country, but again, very, very closely coordinated. AID spends the vast amount of its time uh, in the education arena on basic education because that has been the earmark or the directive as it's been called. Bambi, can I ask you to go one step further in answering the question about roadblocks? Insofar as some of those um, earmarks relate to organizational units, in other words, specific programs um, either have their own account, in some cases they have their own account plus their own office, to what extent will that be a problem when you start talking about dismantling different organizational units or combining them because there are members of Congress who are very wedded to that particular issue and therefore would not want to see the account somehow be combined with other accounts or units be, you know, dismantled or consolidated? You know, I don't know or fully understand uh, the, the opinions um, on the Hill right now. So I'm talking again, um, having come back from overseas to talk almost annually about a given country budget or defending X program or being beat over the head because we weren't doing enough of something. Um, I do feel that um, it is very difficult for an agency to go through these very dramatic shifts. So I do hope there will be a, a modicum of con continuity. Um, the the areas where you know I know there's the most nervous nervousness right now are in the environment area. Uh, many of these programs are things that uh, USAID has been doing for years, like national parks in countries that have some of the most important natural resources in in the world. Um, they're uh, not directly climate change related. Um, they're very local agriculture related and the linkage between agriculture and sustainable development and sustainable economies and local communities. So my hope is that there will be a, a level of continuity in those areas. Others that um, were emphasized by the previous administration um, in some very, very important countries, um, areas like civil society strengthening, government institution strengthening, anti-corruption. These are bedrocks of countries functioning well and functioning um, at the service of their citizens. I hope that um, we don't see dramatic changes in that regard because these are ones where um, a lot of work went into laying the groundwork, um, but you know, one never knows. We have been through that whiplash before. Hopefully this time it won't hurt too much. Um, but I do think uh, we need to recognize um, the same way the United States wasn't built in, you know, 10, 15 years or within a budget cycle, our institutions took many, many decades um, to build and we're dealing in, uh, with countries that very often don't have the same economic potential that the United States had throughout its history. So knock on wood. All right, awesome. Uh, thank you for choosing me. Uh, my name is Khalif Robinson. I am a fellow in uh, Congresswoman Karen Bass's office on the Hill. Um, so I wanted to ask about what you all feel is the way to promote a positive external perception of the U.S. in light of recent policies that seem to be stepping back from global programs. Uh, this is maybe with regard to the proposed cuts. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Eliana Monteforte. I work for Management Sciences for Health, an international not-for-profit public health organization. 
And I was just wondering, if this merger were to happen, it would kind of, looking into a crystal ball, um, how do you think that would impact implementing agencies like MSH in terms of how much funding we might receive from USAID and what kind of partnerships we would have with USAID as a result of this merger? Thank you. Hi, <clears throat> uh, my name is Ambassador Gil Robinson. Um, I was the former Deputy Director of USIA. Uh, I think uh, the, um, um, uh, the unmerger of uh, uh, USIA is one of the worst uh, decisions the US government, bipartisan, has made. My question is that if USIA existed today, it would be the coordinating force in the government on IS, ISIS. Uh, the defeat of ISIS propaganda would be coordinated by USIS. Today, I would like to know who in the government is doing that coordination. Great, so ways to promote positive external perceptions of the US how is a potential merger, merger going to affect external partners? And then who is leading efforts to um, discredit ISIS propaganda? I can start with the last question from Ambassador Robinson. Interestingly enough, in the State Department, there was a little bit of a discussion in 2010 between the Bureau of Counterterrorism and the Undersecretariat for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs on how to stand up a messaging unit to counter terrorism. And in the end, it was the Global Strategic uh, Engagement Center, GSEC, that was stood up under R rather than under CT because R had resources, let alone the fact that R does messaging for a living. GSEC went through several different iterations. It became the Center for Strategic Counterterrorism Communication. And because there's no such thing as a new idea, it's now rebranded as the Global Engagement Center. Um, but it is still firmly in the R family. It is a messaging center. It, there has been discussion about whether it is a State Department entity with interagency detailees or an interagency entity with State Department uh, personnel. I think they would like to be the latter, but they're still f uh, pretty solidly the former. But they do have people from NCT from the agency, from DOD, and from across the State Department working on how to engage um, and, and prevent radicalization. And this gets back to the earlier comment on um, how do we uh, engage. We realize that us kind of snarkily engaging ISIS directly which was the paradigm up through about 2012 to 2014, wasn't as effective as now. They're very much working through partnerships um, so that they're helping give content for public service announcements and then they give them to a partner agency in the UK who then run with it. Or we're working with the Sawab Center in the Emirat, the, with the Emiratis. Uh, there's a messaging center in Malaysia. We're working with the Saudi government. We're also looking at even doing with an NGO in Nigeria with the idea that it's not the US government that's gonna be the most effective. Um, I'll go to the, uh, I don't want to talk about walking back from global because I, I don't think we know yet totally other than um, the issue related to the Paris Agreement. Um, I, people are out there on the ground in embassies AID doing the work that they do on a daily basis. Um, I think this, uh, how the budget proposal plays out in the coming months, perhaps year, is going to uh, tell us more about that. Uh, maybe others who have had more direct experience can speak to that. Um, on Management Sciences for Health and the partners, um, frankly, whether we have in-sourced government or outsourced government, you know um, during the Clinton years there was a push to um, outsource government, which was one of the justifications for the downsizing and the, the reorganization of government was all about contracting out. Um, I have seen par our partner organizations thrive. New, appear new ones appear, there have been mergers, there haven't. Um, the work has to get done. And the U.S. government, speaking from the standpoint of USAID, does not have the people to be out there delivering bed nets, 
doing the on, gr on the ground community work. Um, having said that, um, it is worth watching the budget. Um, for example, in the, in the field that you're in, you know, will the health programs, which have been so robust in recent years, survive in the same way, shape, and form they have? This is just homework all of, you know, everybody has to do. Um, and watch it closely and um, make your voice heard. Just uh, so as a veteran of administration that had a, a, a different start, but some parallels, withdrawing from Kyoto, uh, International Criminal Court, these were the first two policies right out of the box. Our ambassadors were a little surprised um, in the field. We didn't check with them first, but uh, after the, you know, outpouring of public support as a result of 9-11, things settled into a pattern, but it was exactly the kinds of assistance programs, PEPFAR, uh, the programs that President Bush uh, launched, uh, tsunami relief, earthquake relief. It was, it was develop, it was actually development programs and response and helping people that, that moved the needle most uh, in terms of national perception and public perception. So if, if you can find that sweet spot of matching our values to our rhetoric, listening to other countries, strengthening our alliances, and doing really good work in the field, in the development, you've got something. And the, what you don't want to lose is the elasticity, the muscle memory of that in any way, shape, or form, because policies will come and go but it's these institutions that are vital and that must sort of remain intact. They need to improve, they need to do things more efficiently, they need to coordinate more effectively, but once you do away with them, you really lose a cap capability that, you know, will not be in our, uh, to our uh, advantage. So we're out of time, but I wanna do one last round of lightning questions. So state your question as quickly as possible. I wanna give our panelists a chance to react and also give any final words that they want to. So you've been very patiently waiting, go ahead. Thank you, Renata Hallen, European Union delegation. I'm the development counselor there. Going into the direction of a merger U.S. aid, State Department, three questions. What would be the size of a merger, of complete merger, U.S. aid into State Department compared to USIA into State Department? Are we talking of the same magnitude? What are related additional issues to tackle, possibly? Second, would there be any benefits that you would see from partial mergers of functions of U.S. aid into State Department? let's say, go halfway or some way along the proposals of this administration, um, kind of uh, where are the efficiency gains that you would imagine? Would they be exactly where I see the biggest cuts proposed or big cuts proposed in the functioning arena of, of USAID, like in the USAID PBL office? That would, if that would go away, no policy making function in USAID. Third, would you see well, that a merger would... I think we'll have to leave it at that, um, two questions. It's related. Okay, quickly. <laughs> In case of a full merger, would you see a possibility that you have first and second class uh, Department of State officials? Great. There's a gentleman in the back, all the way back there, yeah. Thank you. Um, Bristol Richards with Freedom House. Uh, with global declines in freedom and rising illiberalism and authoritarianism, who's taking the role in promoting democracy, capacity, and coordination, and who should take the role between uh, USIA, USAID, and the State Department? Thank you. Great. Any over here? I feel like you guys have been neglected. No? Okay. Um. Mike Crosswell, formerly of the Policy Office. Uh, how, to what extent can you go about a reasonable discussion of reorganization without a national security strategy? And second, uh, if that strategy were to say development is a pillar of national security, as, it, as has been said before, does that mean development progress is a pillar of national security, or does that mean foreign aid is a pillar? Foreign aid is a tool, but development is a goal. Let's go down the line with uh, responses and any final responses and any final words that you want to say. Well, I think you're right. It's about results. 
It's about the impact of these programs. I think all these, the mechanisms and tools are uh, the means, and we need to look for the most effective means. And, and I think the, the consensus is right now that maybe there hasn't been enough due diligence in terms of what the implications of, of that this change in structure would be to the impact on the ground. I'll take the moment to uh, say my final words, which are uh, I'm, I'm so delighted to be here and to take part in what I hope will be uh, a stimulus for a, a serious uh, rethink about, uh, about merging the US, USAID into the State Department. I'll take the question about rising a liberalism, given that that's my sector. I do think that um, democracy, human rights, and governance is one of the areas where there is greatest um, duplication of effort. And so I think one of the areas that folks will be looking at in terms of where we can strengthen the functionality by pulling some of the pieces together will be in that space. But I want to say very adamantly that there are a lot of people who are you know, big supporters for democracy, human rights, and governance efforts who recognize those are essential, both to our national security in this particular moment in time, as well as to development outcomes. So where it ends up being housed, I think is still an open question. But for sure, there are opportunities to actually preserve and strengthen that function by addressing some of the duplication of effort that has been created over the last couple of years. And Secretary Tillerson has been on the record as enunciating American values and the fact that America continues to be a leader and wants to be a leader in the, these issues. So we have certainly not abandoned them in this administration. I just wanted to take on your question on the, and of course, this is mostly for the ambassador on USAID, but a partial merger I would not advocate. As Ambassador Keith knows, there were a lot of bold plans for merging USAID into the State Department. The his, historian's office is part of the Bureau of Public Affairs, so I've had the privilege of looking at some of these discussions uh, about the merger. And in fact, they w chose the path of least resistance, and we're still combating the idea that Ambassador Holliday's old bureau, the Bureau of International Information Programs, and the Bureau of Public Affairs has some what looks to the outside uh, duplication, but when you dig deeper, it's actually kind of hard to coordinate. But 18 years later, we're still discussing that. So if we're going to merge, we should do it all the way and get it over with, because otherwise you're going to have unresolved issues that linger. I was looking at numbers um, in terms of staffing. And in 1998, following the reduction in USIA staff, um, there were approximately 6,000 staff members. I assume that did not involve locally employed staff in country. Um, USAID, um, over half of those, well over half of those were in Washington. A portion of them were the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And I think the total foreign service was about 1,000. It was so, down to 500 by the merger. By, down to 500 yeah. by the merger. USAID has between 1,800 and 2,000 foreign service officers today. I'm probably wrong on that because we, there are a lot of retirements that are, that are going on. Um, but the vast majority of USAID staff is both civil service in Washington and then foreign service nationals abroad. Any given aid mission is somewhere between 60 and 75 percent local staff. So a merger of that sort is extremely complicated given the amount USAID depends for managing money and managing programs on locally employed staff. So this is something that would have to be looked at. In terms of duplication of function, we all know which functions those are. The ones that state is now doing, but not just State Department. Um, you can include emergency assistance, which Department of Defense also works on. The interagency process has become much more complicated. Um, that's why I vote for a very careful structuring of the interagency, um, independent of the merger issue very careful uh, structuring of the interagency, streamlining of that going forward, um, because we now know we spend an inordinate amount of time on interagency coordination. And on that, as Dan mentioned in the opening, CSIS will be issuing a report from the task force 
drawing on expertise from a lot of different people who have served in Democratic and Republican administrations as career foreign service and civil service officer officers as well as political appointees. Um, and that report will address some of these specific questions and recommendations around reform and restructuring. So on that note, we're gonna um, close it out by thanking the panel for their excellent presentations and comments. <laughs> And I wanna thank you for your um, attention and also your really excellent questions. Thank you so much.